Praise God, praise God, praise God. Look over at somebody and say, Ha! Good morning. However you want to say it. Ha! Ha! Amen. Amen. Didn't, didn't the praise team do a great job this morning? Let's give them a hand. I'm thankful that they can step in and just keep right on going. And uh, it's great. So if you got your Bibles this morning, we're going to be looking in the book of Exodus. Uh, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 12. So if you want to go ahead and be turning there. Um, but to kind of give you just a little recap, I guess. Last week I preached on the subject of safety glasses. Everybody remember and got your safety glasses? Anybody use your safety glasses this week? I hope you did. And I ain't talking about the ones I gave you. So, um, But we talked on the subject of safety glasses and we talked about the necessity of living in the Word and keeping the Word in front of us so that everything that we see has got to be seen through the Word of God. We talked about how we've got to hide the word in our heart so that we might not sin against God. Uh, you know, how will we know whether or not we're actually living what God wants us to live unless we get in his word and know what it says? Amen. Amen? So we talked about how, that we must, uh, uh, how we must allow the word to keep things from entering our lives that cause us to live contrary to the Word of God. Because when the devil comes at us, he comes at us very subtly, and, and he tries to, one of his tactics is to get us to look at things from a different perspective. And uh, that's what he done with, with Eve in the garden, because he, he, he made her question, you know, did God really mean what he said, or can we just look at it just a different way? And so, regardless of how we look at things, we must hold fast to the Word of God. We must hold fast to the Word of God. Amen. Amen. So this week, we're going to kind of somewhat stay on that same thought. So if you got your Bibles, I want to look at Exodus chapter 12. <clears throat> and in this chapter, God speaks to Moses and Aaron. And He gives them instructions about the Passover. Um, if... if um, if you look at, and we'll look at what led up to that. But let's read here in Exodus chapter 12, beginning with verse 5. If you have that, say amen. 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 The Bible says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire." And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So shall you eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the, the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord." Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Will you pray with me this morning, Father? I thank you so much for your word, God. I thank you for the worship that has already taken place here this morning. God, I pray that you would just have your way with everything else that goes on. 
God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would send the comforter, Lord, that you would send the helper this morning along by to help me to be able to preach what you have gave me already. But God, bring all of this stuff back to my remembrance, God. I pray an anointing would fall on this house, God, so that we would hear exactly what you would have to say to us this morning, God. And Lord, we just give you all praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name and let the church say amen. If you back up and read the first 11 chapters of Exodus, you will see that the children of Israel are in a very bad situation. They've been in Egypt for 430 years, and during that time, Exodus chapter 1 tells us that a new king arises over Egypt that does not know Joseph. He doesn't know what happened at, at, at the end of the book of Genesis. He doesn't remember all of the stuff that happened with jo Joseph. He doesn't remember the dreams that he told him and all of the stuff that prepared them to get them through the famine. So he looks around and he sees the number of, of the Israelites. And so he was afraid of them and he was afraid that they would join with their enemies and defeat them. So he puts them in bondage. He afflicted them with hard labor. He even began to kill their newborn sons and, and to kill their sons in, 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 in general. Then God raises up Moses. Moses was raised up by Pharaoh's daughter. He lived in Pharaoh's palace. He, he ate Pharaoh's food. But eventually Moses had to make a choice between who he was going to, to be a part of and who he was going to identify as and who he was going to identify with. And so he eventually he had to flee into the wilderness. I, I think sometimes we overlook the, the moments that we have in the wilderness. There, there, people don't like the, the times that we have to go through the wilderness. But I have learned in my own life, and in, in, when you read throughout the book of the, uh, throughout the Bible, you will understand that a lot of times it's in the wilderness when we can really encounter God. Because when we're living in a palace and everything is just going so nice and so easy, we don't always turn to God. But it's when we're in a wilderness, when there's nothing going the way that it should go, when we don't have all of the luxuries that we have, that's when a lot of times we turn to God. And we can have those encounters. It was, it was, while, he was while Moses was on the backside of the desert where he eventually had an encounter with God at the burning bush. And so while he was there, God instructs Moses to go back to Egypt. And he is to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. So eventually he makes his way there. He meets up with Aaron. And so they go into front of Pharaoh and they tell Pharaoh what God says. But, but Pharaoh refuses. So he refuses to let them go. So God sends ten plagues upon Egypt. Each plague was, was worse than, than the first. But regardless of how bad things got, regardless of how bad these plagues were, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not let the children of Israel go. I know some people in here this morning that if God sent a plague of frogs on them, they'd say, God, take the frogs, I'll do whatever you want. Sometimes we got a lot of frogs at our house. I've almost thought, I'm like, God, are you sending frogs here? I, my wife takes care of them. She's terrified of them. But she's got a BB gun. And she's like a sniper going around after them frogs. Every night before she gets ready to go to bed, she's like, honey, I'm going to bed. Then I hear her in there with the BB gun. <laughs> got one. So after the ninth plague... Then we come to Exodus chapter 11. And it's here that God instructs Moses and he tells him about what's going to take place with the 10th plague. And he tells him, uh, uh, gives him instructions concerning the Passover. So if you read here in Exodus chapter 11 verses 4 through 6, the Bible says, Then Moses says, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals, then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, 
such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. God tells them, he says, I'm going to pass through the land. And whenever I pass through the land, every firstborn is going to die. Regardless. It doesn't matter if it's man. It doesn't matter if it's animal. It doesn't matter if you are high enough to be Pharaoh. It doesn't matter if you're one of his officers in his court. It doesn't matter if you're the lowest of servants. Every firstborn is going to die. Even the firstborn of the animals will die. This plague, it's like no other. And so you would imagine, surely out of all of the things that's happened so far, this will get Pharaoh's attention. Surely now Pharaoh will let the children of Israel go. But there's one small problem. Can anybody imagine what that problem is? Judgment is on the way to Egypt. But the children of Israel are still in Egypt. Don't, don't miss that. Judgment was coming on to Egypt, but the children of Israel was still there. God is going to pass through the land, and when He does, every firstborn will die regardless of who it is. It doesn't matter who you are, because when God says He's going to do it, He's going to do it. But the problem was only a problem in certain people's eyes, because God already had a plan. See, God has a plan for you and he has a plan for me. And, 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 and so here he has a plan. So that's when we get to Exodus chapter 12 and God institutes the Passover. He said that every family would have to take a lamb. He said you are going to have to take either a goat or a lamb. And this goat or this lamb has to be without spot or blemish. They were to take this lamb and they were to kill it and they were to take some of the blood and apply it to the doorposts and to the lentils of going into the house. And whenever they applied the blood, whenever God passed through and passed over Egypt, whenever the blood was seen upon the doorpost, the blood was a sign. When God seen the blood of the lamb applied to the doorpost, he would pass over them and not destroy them. I am thankful this morning that there has been blood applied to my life so that no matter what comes, when God passes by, he looks by and he says, oh, wait a minute, that one right there belongs belongs to me. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to protect it. My blood, the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied to that. The blood of my son, that one right there belongs to me. Amen. See, I, I, I firmly believe I've, I've come by here this morning to tell everybody here, there is coming a day of judgment that judgment will come to this world. There is going to come a day when judgment will come to this world. I'm not talking about just judgment to America. I'm talking about there will come a day when judgment will come to this world. And I don't think that we have much time left in this world until God sends His Son Jesus to gather His bride. And once the bride is gone, once the bride is removed, uh, then I believe when, when that happens, then judgment will be unleashed on this world unlike anything that we've ever seen, heard, or thought about. And not a single person will be exempt from the things that are going to come on this world. You won't be able to hide. If you are left after the rapture, you're going to go through the judgment of God that will happen on this world. I'm not talking about the day of judgment. I'm talking about when God unleashes His wrath on this earth. When you go to go through everything that's written in the book of Revelation, if you want to know something that will scare the hell out of you, hopefully... And what I mean by that is it'll get you out of hell. Because we've got some inside of us. So you need to get into the book and figure out what's going to happen. If nothing else will get your attention, get into the book of Revelation. I don't want to go through it. So I don't plan on it. So I'm going to apply the blood. I'm going to plead the blood. I'm going to let the blood wash me white as snow so that I don't have to go through this. But if you are left, you're going to endure it. Well, somebody, will you hand me my water up here, please? You won't be able to hide. You won't be able to outrun it. 
You won't be able to talk your way out of it. You won't be able to do anything to escape the judgment that's coming. Some people think, well, you know, I'm smart enough. I've been around church enough. See, the devil had me completely confused whenever I was lost. Because I was raised in church. And I always heard the preacher, that, the, the, the pastor over the church that I was raised up in, I always heard him talking about those that endure to the end. They will be saved. So I always thought, well, you know what? I can endure. I know enough about church and God that I'm not going to take the mark of the beast. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to refuse it. I'm not going to bow down and, 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 and down to the devil. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be good. I don't have to live for Jesus right now. I can just do whatever I want to do. And then whenever all this bad stuff comes, I'll just endure and I'll make it to heaven. I don't want to go through everything. Because I will never make it on my own. And you won't make it on your own. You need Jesus to make it. We need Him every day in our life. It's hard enough now. The price of groceries is high now. The price of gas is high now. Imagine when it gets to the place when you've got to feed your children and they come and tell you, well, if you don't take this mark, you're not going to get any food. And your baby's crying. And its belly's swelling up. And then the devil could come right, well, now... Look at it from a different perspective. God knows that baby's got to eat. And so then we try to justify things. And we try to change what the Word of God says. So, it's bad now. It's going to get a whole lot worse. And there's not anything that we can do to escape it. But, I'm thankful that just like in the book of Exodus, whenever God was going to pass through the land of Egypt, God knows that we are still in this world. And so He knew that we would need a way of escape from the judgment that was going to come on the world. And so God prepared a Passover lamb for us. He prepared a Passover lamb for us. It, this time it's not the blood of a goat or a sheep that is going to save us. This time, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that is going to save us. This time, it's the blood of the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. This time, it's the blood that flowed out of Jesus' body and it flowed down that cross on Golgotha. That's the blood that's going to save us. That's the Passover Lamb that's going to save us. The world will tell us all kinds of things. We hear all kinds of stuff. People always try to tell you, well, you know, there's many different paths and we're all going to the same place. And it doesn't matter what religion and what God you talk to. We're all really praying to the same God. No, we're not. No, we're not. I don't care what the world says. There is only one way to heaven and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody want to take a snippet of that? Post it all over Facebook? Go for it. Because it's only through the blood of Jesus that we can be saved. There's only one name what men might, that men might be saved. And that is the name of Jesus. You're not going to make it to heaven just because your name is on a church roll. You're not going to make it to heaven just because you're a member of the church of God. You're not going to make it to heaven just because you're a member of a Baptist church. You're not going to make it to heaven just because you've been baptized. It's going to take the blood of the Lamb that has been applied to your life and you get into the Word of God and stay in the Word of God. So I'm thankful that the Passover and how all of this points us to Christ because He's our hope. He's the only way that we can be saved. But, but as I read this, something else jumped out at me. I'm thankful for all of that. But, 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 but there's something else that's important here that a lot of times when we read this, we skip over. And, and, and I heard somebody else, they was preaching out of this same scripture, but they didn't touch on what I'm going to preach on. And so as they read that scripture during their sermon, God stopped me on this one part. And he began to speak to me about this. 
See, they were to kill the lamb and put some of the blood on the doorposts so that when God passed over, they would be saved. But God didn't end His instructions with telling them, just put the blood on it and stop there. See, a lot of people have this really bad misunderstanding and they think, well, once they get saved, that's it. I went to an altar one time. I got down on my knees, I prayed, I cried, I slung snot, I, I, I stayed down there, I prayed through, and I get up, and that's it. I'm saved. I don't have to do anything else. I'm good. I'm going to make it to heaven. The blood's been applied. I'm on my way. Praise God, I'm heading to a bar. Come on, people think that. I'm going to continue living the exact same way that I was before I got on my knees. Because somebody told me that as long as I walk an aisle, get down to an altar, and I pray, that's all I've got to do. That's not all we've got to do. It's not all we've got to do. If it was, he wouldn't have continued with the instructions. Because getting born again, getting saved, isn't the end. It's the beginning. That's why it says... Being born again. When you're born, it's not the end of your life. It's the beginning of your life. And that's whenever everything starts and, and you've got to have the milk that comes and, and eventually you grow and then you get to where you, 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 you need the meat. But after they killed the lamb and put the blood on the doorpost, look at what God told them in Exodus chapter 12 verse 8. He says, then you shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roast it in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. But let me, can I, can I tie something together here for you? Because there's some scriptures in the New Testament when you get to them and, and you read it, it, it always kind of made me kind of scratch my head and say, no. What is this? So in Exodus, God instructs them to eat the flesh of the Passover lamb. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 6, verses 53 through 56. It says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I am him. Jesus, the Passover lamb, says that unless we eat his flesh, we have no life in us. Unless we eat the flesh of Jesus. And drink the blood of Jesus. We have no life in us. We'll read that. Now, now, I'm just plain and simple whenever it comes to a lot of this stuff. So I, I can understand eating a lamb or a goat. Give me a lamb chop. Mmm. I like it. But how in the world can I eat the flesh of Jesus? You ever think about that? How can you eat the flesh of Jesus? If you read further on in John chapter 6, Jesus even says, he says, this is a hard saying. And then he goes on, and many of his disciples, the Bible says that many of his disciples walked away from him whenever he told them that. But look at what Peter says in John 6, 68. Jesus had just asked the 12, he said, are you going to leave me as well? And this is what Peter says. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We ain't got nowhere else to go. If you're looking for a hope, your only hope is Jesus. You can't hope on a big bank account. You can't place your hope in your children. You can't place your hope in your spouse. You can't place your hope in this building. 
The only hope that we have is through Jesus because His words gives us eternal life. We are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, but this says we must also continue in Him. So we must consume Him. We must continue to consume Him. How do you do that? Well, John chapter 1 verse 1 says this. It says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the way that we eat the flesh of Jesus, Wayne said it, you get into this. You get into this. See, so many Christians, we take this, we like to pack it, we like to hold on to it, we put it in our car, we, 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 we make an idol out of it, but we never open it. And we never consume it and get it on the inside of us. All we do is go around saying, well, I'm saved and the blood's been applied. But what, what's the Bible say? Well, I, I don't know. Well, what did Jesus say? What, what, what's the importance of the Passover? What's the importance? Where did the, the blood come from? What, what, well, I don't know. They just told me to go pray. They just said, now repeat this prayer after me. I think sometimes we need to recon reconsider if we really are saved or not. Some people probably say, now preacher, don't be preaching like that. We do. We need to, we need, we need to re really reconsider. Because if our life is no different than the way it was when we went to the altar, then after we get up from the altar, I don't really know if we're saved or not. Because there has to be a difference. Because the Bible says that you have become a new creation. If you're still acting like the old self, you've not become new. I'll move on. So the way that we eat the flesh is not just, not simply just reading the word, but it's also studying the word. It's meditating on the word. It's digesting the Word. It's living in the Word. It's applying the Word of God to our lives. It's whenever we read it that we actually pray and we ask God and we say, God, how can I apply this to my life? How, how does this affect me where I am right now? We've got to get into the Word because that's what keeps us alive. Because the, His words are life. Whenever Jesus was tempted by the devil, this is what He told him in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. He says, but He answered, Jesus, He answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There is life in the Word. There is power in the Word. There is cleansing in the Word. There is power to get our life right in the Word of God. People, sometimes I hear people and they say, oh, and they don't really tell, but they post it all over Facebook and everywhere else. Oh, my life, it's a mess. Get in the Word. Get in the Word. Oh, I just, I ain't got no joy, I ain't got no peace. Are you in the Word? Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Where am I going to have a conversation with Him? He has already written, written a, a, a love letter to us. And we ignore it. I used to write my wife love letters all the time. And she's probably got most of them stuck back in a shoebox in a closet somewhere. Those love letters were great. Those love letters is what we, especially through basic training, whenever I was in basic training, we, we sent a lot of, of, of love letters back and forth to each other. And that's great. But they're stored back. I don't know if she gets them out and reads them anymore or not. I hope she don't. But we need the love letters of Jesus. Because it's not just paper. Whenever I wrote a lot of those letters, whenever I was young, and when she was young, there was both of us, there was a lot of empty words in them. Because the words was not living because me and you, we can write stuff down on a piece of paper and it not mean anything. But it's what we live. But this, 
This is God breathed. This is not some dead book. This is the living, breathing word of God that we need to get into and we need to stay into it. I said it last week and I'll say it again this week. We need a revival of the word back in the church. We need to get back to where we're hungry for the word. We've got so much other stuff going on that we push the word out of our lives. I've heard people say, well, you know, if I just had time, I would read more. You won't. If you don't make it a priority when you don't have time, you will not make it a priority when you do have time. So we need to get back into the Word. We need to get hungry for the Word. We, we, we need to crave the Word. We need to pick it up, dust it off, open it up, and get into it like we never have in our life. Now I've preached all of that just to get right here. This is where I'm going to start. All of that was just leading up. He didn't just simply tell them to eat the Passover however they wanted to eat it. He gave them specific instructions on what to do. Exodus 12. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire its head with its legs and its entrails. Now, why would, why would God make it such a point as to tell them how they, were eat, how they should eat this Passover lamb? Verse, verse 9 says, do not eat it raw. Why not eat it raw? Why, why not eat it raw? Well, absolutely. What, what, what happens, what can happen to us when we eat raw food, things come into us, impurities come into us that can cause us damage, cause us to get sick because there is bacteria that is, is often present in raw food. And, and once we eat it, we can become sick and sometimes we can even die. Now, what, what in the world are you talking about, preacher? We're talking about the Word. Yes. I'm talking about eating this. I'm not talking about a half-cooked piece of chicken. I'm talking about the Word of God. We can't eat it raw. Because what happens with food, once the food has been exposed to the fire, it kills out all the bad stuff. So when we get into the Word of God, we don't need to just flip open. Find something that matches up with what we already believe to try to justify what we believe. Can I preach that this morning? Y'all still with me? Because you can find a single verse in here that will try to justify something that has just popped in your head. I guarantee you can find it. And it won't take very long because the devil is really good and taking this and twisting it around to get us to live something that's contrary to what this says. I hear people preach it all the time. And I won't get on that. If you want to ask me what I'm talking about on that, come and talk to me after church. But what we need to do is we need to take in the whole word. We don't need to just find a scripture and say, I'm going to take that scripture and I'm going to base everything that I believe off of that scripture. That's why we have people going out and bringing snakes into a church. Because they've taken a scripture, because there's only one scripture that talks about taking up snakes or anything like that. What is the next scripture that talks about taking up snakes? It's when Paul goes on to the island after the shipwreck and a snake comes out of the fire and latches on his hand. He didn't go try to find the snake. The snake found him. He didn't pick it up and start shaking it around and dancing and doing all of this other stuff that we see people do. He says he shook it off 
And then he didn't worry about it. See, we, we, we want to make stuff up into things that the Word of God is not. So we need to take the whole Word of God. We need to meditate on the Word of God. We need to pray over the Word of God. We need to study the Word. We need time to grow in the Word. It's one of the reasons why we have so many immature Christians. It's because we're not in this we think we're good as long as we sit here, but we don't need to just sit there. We need to live in this. But eating it raw is also, it's like those people, and I'm sure you probably know some of these, that as soon as they get up from the altar, they know everything about everything when it comes to living for God. They've been saved five minutes, but they'll tell everybody what they're doing wrong. Well, you, you dress the wrong way. You listen to the wrong music. You eat the wrong thing. You don't understand what this means in the Bible. I, I've, I've ran into these people. People fly into a church sometimes. And then they all of a sudden they think they know more than everybody else. Everybody else is wrong. If everybody else is wrong, don't you think God would show everybody else? You're not special enough for God to be the only one that God showed you something. I'm sorry, I just popped somebody's bubble right then. But they know everything. They know everything about how you need to live. They, they just got up and wiped the tears off. And they're already telling you what, to, what you're doing wrong. They know, they, they, they start telling people, well, you need to sing this type of song. Or you need to sing that type of song. Pastor, maybe you should be doing this. Pastor, you should be doing that. Well, you don't need to be reading that Bible. You need to be reading this Bible. They, they're, 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 they're quick. And they know everything that everybody's doing wrong. And they're quick to point it out. See, these people, they're attempting to live out a Christian life without going through the process of really being saved. Because being saved, yes, you are saved. Whenever you accept Jesus, when that blood's been applied, you've been saved. But there's also some cleansing that needs to take place. The Bible talks about it, it says, by the washing of the word. Because if you don't get in the word, you're not going to be washed and you're not going to be cleansed. So there are people that they just get up from the altar and they, they believe they know everything and they have no need for anything else. That's what eating this raw means. And when you do that, that's the same of sitting down and taking a raw piece of chicken and taking and eating it because then you're going to get all kinds of junk in you. We need to go and we need to allow the Holy Spirit to teach us, but we need to also connect ourselves to a local body of believers where we can be discipled so that we can know and understand what the Word of God says. Because what is the point of all of this? It's not just so we can come and I can stand up here and preach or yell or do whatever else I'm doing. The job of the local church is to equip the people so that we can live out this. If you come on back up to the music, we're getting ready to... I told Valerie, I was showing her a little funny clip and the guy said, we're getting ready to close. I said, I don't hardly ever say that, but I'll say that this morning. Getting ready to close. You know what that means, don't you? That means just hold on. I'm going to lie to you and tell you I'm getting ready to close. I've only got five more pages of notes. No, I'm joking. So God says don't eat it raw. Because that's dangerous. Because we have ideas of things that when we read in the Word... That maybe aren't true. And so we need to make sure that it is cooked. And that it's seasoned with fire. But he also tells them in Exodus chapter 12 verse 9. Don't eat it boiled at all with water. Now this is really what got my attention out of this whole thing. He says don't eat it boiled. In any water. And whenever I heard that part, it just hit me. And God said, 
why do you think that I told them that? And I said, I don't know. So I began to pray. And I began to seek God. And I began to study. And, and, and so, boiling is an act that assimilates. Do you know what assimilates means? Assimilates means you merge things. Boiling is an act that assimilates while roasting separates. Mm. Boiling brings everything together, puts it in the pot, cooks it down and makes it all kind of the same. But when you roast something, it's separating things. See, we have too many people in the church that whenever they get into the Word of God, they want to take it from a, from a world perspective and they allow the Word to be boiled down to where it assimilates everything else. So, when, when, when we boil something, we draw in several ingredients into the object that we're boiling. How many of y'all like a good, a good beef roast? You put it in the crock pot. You got some carrots. You got some onions. You got some potatoes. All of the, and it all cooks together. Wayne's getting hungry. But it all cooks together. To where everything kind of has that same flavor. Now it, it may be good on that. There ain't nothing wrong with that. But what else happens to that meat? It becomes soft and can be easily broken apart. Because whenever you, whenever you boil something, these, these ingredients, they, they assimilate with the other object, which absorbs the added components and even adapts itself to them. And when absorbing the other ingredients, it, it expands, it becomes soft, and it begins to disintegrate. It, it, when if you open up a pot roast and you, you touch it, and it just falls apart. It's amazing. But you don't want what your life to be based on to fall apart. It can't fall apart. It can't fall apart. Roasting, however, it does the reverse. Its main function is to expel. Not only does it remove all of the blood, but it also separates all of the ingredients that are not essential to the meat. I hope my mom don't watch this. Tina doesn't know where I'm going. I thought about calling her this morning and telling her, Mom, I won't tell this story. Don't get your feelings hurt. Mom, if you're watching, don't get your feelings hurt. Whenever I was growing up, whenever I was a teenager, um, my mom always took care of me. I, I'm, I'm the baby. She would cook me anything I wanted. And listen, I'm telling you, I was babied and I'm proud of it. My brothers, they want to give me a hard time. I'm like, I'm sorry, mom loves me more. <laughs> Deal with it. But I, girl, I told her, I said, Mom, I want a steak. Now, in my mind, I grew up, we didn't eat steak because there was seven of us kids. There was nine people in the house, not including all the cousins that was over there half the time. So we never ate steak. So whenever it was just me at home, I told her, I, I want steak. So my mom goes to the store and she brings, gets some steak, and they're about this big around and about that thick little bitty thin steak that ain't got no fat on it and so she would get those little steaks and you know how she'd cook it she'd boil it she'd take a pan put it on the stove and pour water in it and boil that steak until it was like leather she didn't know how to do it she had never fixed steak like that before. She, she didn't know. Sometimes she would even... How many of y'all uh, like A1 sauce on your steak? Have you ever ate it cooked in it? Don't. 
Don't. It's not good. So she would boil that steak. Now it was till years later, I went to a restaurant and I ordered a steak and it was about that thick. And they said, how do you want it cooked? And I said, heat it up. I, I don't know. I didn't know what they were talking about. I said, I, I don't know. But they brought that steak out and it had been roasted over an open fire at that restaurant. It had the flames coming up and kissing it. It had it seared real good. It had the, the, the fat had been rendered down to where it was just soft, kind of crunchy on the outside. Mmm. Man, I cut that thing open. I took a bite of that steak and I was like, Whoo, where have you been all my life? People like, I, I see people at a restaurant, they cut the fat off and they lay it over. To, I'm like, hey, you want to eat that? Oh, mm. But that's how we are when we get in the Word. So much we've watered it down. We've boiled it to the place to where it falls apart. When we talk to people, people just pick it apart because we haven't taken it in and lived in it and ate it roasted. To where this means what it says it means. It's plain and simple. People get so tore up and they're like, well, you know, you people believe this and you people believe that. If this says it, yes. And if this don't say it, then what we need to do is to allow it to do what, what the roasting is supposed to do, which is to separate all of the ingredients that are, are not essential. What's essential? Get in this and you'll find out. Get in this and you'll find out. There's things that I used to hold on to. And we're like, you know what? If you don't believe this way, I can't even talk to you. I don't even want to deal with you. I don't want to fellowship with you. I don't want nothing. But then the more I get in the Word, the more that I understand that there's some stuff that we believe that aren't essential. Some of the stuff that we hold on to and we have such strong convictions are, you can't even find in this. So we need to allow it to, because what happens is all of those man-made things that we've allowed to get in, it's been boiled into it. We've allowed to assimilate it into it. You, you, you know, most of us have been in church a long time. You gotta start, you gotta have two, two fast songs, two slow songs. You gotta have a new song and an old song. You gotta take up the tithe and offering at a certain time. You, you gotta have church at a certain time. Oh, where is that in here? There's some of that stuff that we need to say, you know what, if it's not in this, it's not that big of a deal. But the problem is, we got to get rid of all of that junk so that we can get into this, so that we can allow that fire to seal it down inside of us. It can expel all of the junk. And the other thing that, that, that roasting does is it shrinks the meat down. It makes it tough. Do you know why you can eat a steak and it be what my wife calls raw, which is like um, medium rare? Mm. Now see, I'm making me hungry now. But do you know why you can eat a steak like that and it not hurt you? It's because the inside of it is sealed. It's not been exposed to all of the contaminants in the outside world. There's no way for the bacteria to get inside of it because the bacteria will sit on the outside. And when you throw that meat onto that fire and it starts to sizzle, it cooks all of that stuff out and it kills all of the bacteria so that we can have the inside of it be nice and soft and 
pink and mmm, tastes so good. You know what? That's the way we need to be. We don't need to allow things to get on the inside and to change what this says. But once we get into it, we find out how much God loves us. We, feel, we, we figure out how we can love each other and we don't have to be so harsh and hard to people. Because we get into all of the, we get all of the junk out of us. So when we get into the Word, we must allow the Word to do what the Word is intended to do. Because the Word of God will cause us to get some junk out of our lives. I think sometimes that's why people don't want to get into the Word. Because they don't want to get some stuff expelled out of their life. It will cause us to live a life that is separated from the world. And I'm not talking just about getting away from everybody or dressing differently or, or any of that type stuff. I'm talking about it will cause us to live out what the Bible says regardless of what the world says. So when we get into the, into the Word of God, we had better be the ones changing. We had better be the ones changing and not changing it to accommodate us. If you would, stand with me. I struggled last night in praying and was like, God, how do you want me to end this? You may do an altar call. What, what do you want me to do? And I believe that God showed me. So I want you to take your Bible. If you've got one, that's great. If you need one and don't have one at all, get with me. I'll try my best to get you one. But get your, get your Bible. If, if it's on your phone, get your phone. Open up your Bible app. If it's on your phone, open up your Bible app. If you need to find a good Bible app, let me know. I, I, I'll show you. But get your, get your Bible. However... Oh, can I say this? Holy Spirit, thank you. Do you know the Word is the same in this as it is in this? When you read it and you allow it to do what it needs to do, it's the same. It's the same. It's the same Word. It's the same power. It's the same message. So I want you to take your Bible. You don't have to hold it up. I just want you to get it. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. And then after we pray this prayer, I want to pray a pastoral prayer over you. But I want you to pray this prayer with me. Father, you know me better than I know me. If I have ever allowed anything to water down your word, God, please forgive me. Let me hide your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Make your word alive in me and make me alive in you. Oh, praise God. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I bless this congregation. I bless these people. God, I pray right now that you would give us, that you would stir up a hunger in us for your word like we have never had in our life. God, I pray right now that you would give us the resolve to discipline ourselves to get into your word and stay in your word. God, you don't want us to be intimidated by your word. You don't want us to come to it and say, well, I don't understand it, so I'm not going to read it. But God, you want us to come to you and say, God, I need your help. Instruct me, show me, explain this. Holy Spirit, come and be my teacher as I read your word. But God, don't let me just be a reader or a hearer of the word only. But God, let me be a doer as well. So God, I pray that you would bless these people. And God, if they have questions, help them. Put the right people in their life to instruct them. But God, don't let us let your word be watered down. Let us take it for what it says it says. And God, help us to grow closer to you in all things that we do. 
And God, until we come back next week, God, I pray that you would bless them, that you would keep them, that you would watch over them. And just flood their life, God. Fill them with your presence, God. Fill them with your spirit. And help them, God, as they go throughout this week. And Lord, we give you all praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. Church, come out be with us Tuesday night. We have prayer meeting at 6.